Hi, I'm Jennifer Wiggum. And I'm Zach Glazer. And this is episode 532 of the Lawyers Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, Stephanie talks with John Blakey about his leadership book, Force for Good, How to Thrive as a Purpose-Driven Leader. Today's podcast is brought to you by iManage, and you'll hear Zach's conversation with them in just a little bit. But first, it is the week of Thanksgiving. Mm. And Zach, I am grateful for you. Thank you. I, too, welcome. am grateful for me. <laughs> oh, no. Wow. Is that, is that not where we were That not where we were going? No, we can just talk about what you and what you're, you know, why we're you, grateful for you. I mean, I am grateful for you. I think you, you should be grateful for yourself. Thank you. Um, but I think you were just telling me right before we were recording that you were grateful for some other things. Yes. I, you know, in, in, in reality, um, I'm grateful to be working at a, at a company that kind of allows me to, to think big, do yeah. things differently. Um, I'm also grateful to be working at a company that kind of puts its money where its mouth is, you know, like that, that, uh, has, has values that it sticks to core values that it, it runs from that, that I not only get to decide whether I agree with them, but I also get to, to help in the process of determining what those core values are, um, yeah. as, as one of the people at this company. So I am grateful to be working at a place that I don't know, um, has values and values me and lets me be myself. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the big one is, you know, there's there may be things that happen that I disagree with, but my voice is heard, sure. but I can just be me. And that was, you know, that's a long time coming to yeah. be my weird self <laughs> <laughs> at work <laughs> and have it actually be a positive sometimes leading my team or, you know, doing a podcast intro and not have to squelch it down because I'm afraid that it doesn't fit in with a certain type of culture. Um, we value weird here and I really appreciate that. We do. Well, and we value, um, broad thinking we we mm -hmm. value kind of not necessarily taking broad. things thinking broad about thinking. broads okay yes sorry go ahead we we do we i don't we know i'm gonna make this. no comment on that one <laughs> um we we value you know kind of thinking about things differently mm -hmm. and allowing ourselves to think about things differently but then also you know like determining whether or not that's correct or yeah or, you know um we value um you know, measuring things and and uh, kind of going out and and trying stuff, experimenting. But yep. but part of experimenting is is measuring, not just going and doing things willy nilly. It, it, this is not interpretive dance that we're doing over here. Aww, it's it's you, it's chemistry. You're not. I I'm not doing interpretive dance on the podcast. Oh, that's Jennifer. true. We do yeah. have our. Um, weekly afternoon interpretive dance meetings that we hold. Can you imagine? Actually, I can't imagine. That's the thing. It's like... I 100% can't imagine. <laughs> and in fact, I feel like some years ago, we must have had some dance. It doesn't matter. But I'm grateful for my memory of all the interpretive dances I've done. And yeah. this company. And you. And... um our community and our dedication to taking care of our little community, which I think is where you start and can have the most impact is just taking care of each other. So this Thanksgiving, take care of each other, take care of each other. Well, and if it, if it doesn't just go unsaid, Jennifer, I am grateful for you and I'm grateful to be working oh, with you. Thank you. I, well, I'm not going to say what you said back to me. I'm just going to accept the compliment. Thanks. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, because now, here is our conversation with our sponsored guest, and then we'll head into Stephanie's conversation with Dr. Blakey. Hey, y'all. It's Zach, the legal tech advisor here at Lawyerist, and today I've got Tanya Wingfield from iManage with me. Now, iManage is a knowledge management solution for the legal field, uh, and Tanya is one of their change management specialists. Tanya, thanks for being with me. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Tanya, you're you're a change management specialist for a knowledge management company, big knowledge management company. This is, you know, I management, I manage. Um, I imagine you've seen a lot. <laughs> I imagine you've seen a lot of a lot of changes. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are some of the more common um 
uh, I guess, issues or reservations or hiccups that somebody might come across when they're when they're trying to change or or get their their documents mm-hmm. and knowledge in order in their firm? Yeah, I think that one of the big um, things that that I've seen uh, our customers experience, and that is the the apprehension of what does this mean for me? How is it going to affect my day? Uh, how is it going to affect that one way I do something and, and it's so efficient? So um, you have all that fear, and then you have a we still have those the the crowd of employees that, and I hate to say that because I'm near that age, but <laughs> the ones that will I be able to learn at my age? This is so Got different. You. So you know we have the spectrum of all of this different change within the organization, mm-hmm. and from a change management perspective, it is important that we don't take anyone for granted. We have to make sure we assess everything all all the different um, opportunities to be able to find the change and address it and then calm the nerves of people. So that's one of the big things, uh, you know, uh, making sure that we remove those fear factors that are out okay. there. Okay. How how do we go about doing that? You know, if, if I'm somebody saying, how is this going to affect my day? Um, how, how do we go about doing that if I'm the person helping lead the change? Well, you know, one of the most important things, and this is sometimes that um, may get left out in this process, because, you know, the the one thing about IT, we have this wonderful project management plan that we go by. Oh, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. (laughs) Well, well, you know, but often, sometimes what is left out are are the... um, your people like your change management folks like me and your mm-hmm. business analysis folks. And we're the ones going ahead and uh, out there getting the data. Uh, we need to make sure that decisions are data driven and, and that we have the correct data, not assumptions. Ooh. So one of the first things that, um, that's important that I like to see from a change management perspective is working with the business analyst or whoever's doing that, that, that scoping for how that desktop is going to be built. Mm-hmm. And we're interviewing um, the resistors. We can't say, oh, I don't want to talk to them because there's just going to be a headache. We don't want to talk to Susie. <laughs> oh, she's a naysayer. No. We I mean, I can say to that. It's just not going to help. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Her input is critical. Yeah. So we need to go out and find every type of stakeholder that could uh, contribute to the success or the failure of the project and get their perspective of what they think about the change. Uh, what are their expectations as far as what will change? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and of course, in the legal field, if if you tell an attorney, look, I'm going to take you down from five clicks to two, now you know. <laughs> You got a winner there. <laughs> so <laughs> so we want to make sure that, you know, we look at those things. Nothing is minute. Nothing. We ha- we cannot look at anything as um, users just being uh, uh, complacent or just being naysayers or nags. We have to uh, address and take their feedback serious. So we have so to figure out what, what their what their fears are and 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 actually address that. Their fears, their workflows, and, mm. uh, and 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 actually their expectations. What do they expect to get out of this new system? Because they're our customer, and we have to remember that they're the customer. Right, right. Well, if, if people want to to learn more about knowledge management, change management, and and what they can do um, with iManage, they can go to iManage dot com, and I imagine they can they can get a demo with you guys and and get shown around. Definitely. We, we, we have, we have uh, what we call a success hub that we are putting in place. All right. And so these success hubs actually give, uh, we have videos on best practices on how to carry out certain tasks when, when you're in that project management stage. Okay. So get, getting, getting people information to get oh, yes. the information to the, to the people to get this done. Because we're, we, we have to remember we are data driven. Mm-hmm. And so you got to get the information. Decisions that are not data driven are decisions that are uh, set up to fail. I like that. I like that. And honestly, I'm going to end on that. I love that. Um, so that is, uh, again, if people want to learn more about iManage, they can go to iManage.com and they can book a demo. Tanya, I really appreciate you being with me today. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. John Blakey. I'm the author of uh, this book, Force for Good, that was published in August of 2024. And uh, yeah, I've done other things um, that I could bore you with, but uh, I think maybe that's enough for us to uh, to kick off uh, you know, our, our engagement today. Yeah, you're being modest because you've done a lot of things. Um, you've had a pretty amazing career. So thank you for being with me today. Um, maybe to kick us off, you know, I've, I've checked out the book Force for Good, How to Thrive as a Purpose-Driven Leader. And it might be just interesting for you to tell us a little bit about how how you started to come to think of yourself as a, as a purpose-driven leader and what that transition was like. Yeah. Um, so in my career, I've definitely been on a journey, as most leaders are, from a profit-driven focus to a purpose-driven focus. I was at the age of 38, I was the international managing director of a FTSE 100 global software company, which was very profit-focused. And I didn't question that. Uh, it was just the way it was. And I got on with it and I did my best and I got some things right and I got some things wrong. Um, but I think at that time, I started to look around me in that corporate world and I started to question some of the values uh, of the world in which I was operating. And a couple of years later, I left to found my own business as an executive coach. And I started to work with other leaders who were also questioning things, exploring things and experimenting with focusing on pr on purpose rather than profit. And that isn't to say that profit isn't still an important fuel. It's it's just saying, you know, can we go further? Can we go beyond profit uh, to lift our sights, to engage in at the level of purpose and making an impact in, in the world um, that goes beyond wealth creation, um, but still includes that activity? So that's a little bit where I sparked, you know, uh, some of those ideas. I was very inspired by a lot of the clients that I work with who were doing very brave things in the world of purpose, whether that's in private sector or the public sector or the third sector. I published a book in 2016 called The Trusted Executive, and that was all about the power of trust, which is part of building that community of purpose. So that continued to uh, engage me with that community. And Force for Good is is the next iteration of that journey, uh, particularly inspired by a lot of the uh, experiences of, of COVID uh, and the pandemic and what, what I went through as a leader and also what my clients went through. So I'm hoping it's a very practical book um, that speaks to the issues of our time. Yeah. It, it, it resonates that a lot of leaders kind of do go through this journey where you wake up one day and you're like, what am I doing? You know, I'm just, am I all about making money? And, and is there something bigger I should be doing with my business in my community? And, um, mm. and so I think you sort of lead us on some questions that maybe people could be asking along the way. Maybe we don't have to wait till we get older and have this epiphany. We could start the process earlier. Yeah. And there are many reasons for that. I think in the world now, you know, we've got big issues, you know, globally, um, and business is a, is an agent of innovation, an agent of change. You know, if we put that talent to work on some of these big issues, then I think we could have a, you know, a, a really significant impact. So I think there is an imperative now around some of the challenges we face that demands that business leaders step up into this world of purpose, but also at an individual level. You mentioned it really in, in COVID, in the pandemic, you know, I worked with a lot of very confident, successful leaders, and CEOs. Who, who were waking up in the morning thinking, is it worth it? You know, they, they'd reached a mm. point of really questioning that purpose. And I think the pandemic did give us all a bit of a wake-up call around some of those big questions. And we're still working through that, I think, in terms of the after, aftermath. I often talk about the transition from a life of success to a life of significance. And I think, mm, yeah. you know, historically we've seen, as you said, that it's almost like you have to get success first and then you ask that question, you know, am I now ready to live a life of significance? But I think the younger generations need to be um, challenging themselves to live a life of success and significance, to make it, you know, a, an inclusive mindset that says you don't have to have either success or significance. You can set your stall out such that you are looking to generate both in your life. And I think, you know, that's the challenge, particularly for those younger generations to show that that's possible and, and to prove that that's the way that business can show up in the world. 
Absolutely. I underlined that in my book when I read it, you know, a life of significance. I love that. In the book, you also give us this this framework, I guess you would call it, of of a purpose driven leadership that's up in out. I don't know where does it start or in out up where it's a triangle. So I don't know if there's a good starting yeah. place, but I would love for you to, <laughs> to tell us more about how that works. Yeah, well, it's a triangle as you say. So you can start at any point. I I typically start at the up because I think the up yeah okay. the up probably comes comes first. So I go up in out on the triangle. Um, so yeah, the, the, the reason for this model is really the subtitle of the book is how to thrive as a purpose-driven leader. So my audience is really those people and leaders who've already said, you know, I do want to stand for purpose. I do want to live this life of significance as well as a life of success. How do I do it well? How do I do it when I'm thriving? Because there are a lot of purpose-driven leaders who feel their purpose as a burden and Mm -hmm. not as a joy. And so I think we want to be thriving as purpose-driven leaders rather than uh, martyring ourselves, you know, against this, this, this wonderful purpose. So that's why I have this model in the book, Up, In, and Out. And the up is very much as the name implies, it's about the purpose, you know, whatever you want to call your purpose, your calling, your vocation, you know, what is it that has that presence for you? that means that you put that first uh, and that gives you that guiding light, that true north. Um, So do you know what that purpose is? How do you stay connected with it? How do you make sure it still feels like a joy rather than a burden? So that's the up. The in is really about how we take care of ourselves on the journey because there are purpose-driven leaders who who self-sacrifice and, and, you know, run out of energy halfway through the race and that doesn't really help us, you know, we want those leaders to finish the race. So how do we look after our motivation, our resilience, our well-being? And then the out is how do we bring people with us on this purpose-driven journey? Not everybody is going to be as passionate about your purpose as you are on day one. So how do you engage people? How do you build that followership? Uh, In particular, in a post-pandemic world where a lot of talent is asking themselves big questions, is wondering, you know, where do I give this extra discretionary effort? Do I give it to you or do, you give it, do, do I give it to somebody else or something else in my life? So I think we have to work hard at building that followership that allows us to turbocharge the progress towards that purpose. So that's how the up, in and out works. And it's just a simple framework that hopefully is memorable and allows people to create a language to talk about these challenges. Yeah. With the up, um, I think that's where you talk about, you really have to understand your why. Like, you know, why are you doing this? Why do you get out of bed every day? You, you said that one of the people you worked with in, in, when they went through this exercise, they had such clarity about their life that they didn't have before. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about it here around business vision, for example. We're always saying like, you you really do need this, people. It's not just it's not just a catch word that we use. And so I also loved this idea that as individuals, we need to be really clear on our why. Um, and, and I wonder how, you know, how would you talk to the skeptics who are just like, oh, here's Stephanie and, and John again going on with these, you know, vision words that they keep <laughs> droning on about. Yes, yes. There are a lot of skeptics, aren't there? There are always a lot of skeptics, you know, and that's part of one of the things we're going to have to get used to in this purpose-driven life, that that there are going to be people who want to stand against it or who, who question it or, 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 or are trying to sort of um, uh, bring you into their world. Um, and I think it means we need a lot of courage, um, you know, as purpose-driven leaders. Um, and the up, I think it, that that purpose is what gives you that courage because when you're clear about what you're standing for, it's much easier to stand for it. Uh, if you're very vague about it or you haven't quite nailed it down, it's harder to hear that voice of purpose clearly in your head. And, and we need to hear it clearly in those times where we get the setbacks, where we get the cynics, where we get the the skeptics, because they're going to come thick and fast if you... If you um, plant your flag in this place, then you are going to get a lot of, uh, yeah, pushback. And so that up is really important. And one of the gateways to discovering that clarity, and you mentioned the story from the book, is 
being very in touch with your personal values. Um, one of the most powerful coaching exercises I work with is a values elicitation exercise where I help leaders uncover and be precise about the five to seven personal values that really light up their life. And once those values are clear, that's the gateway to articulating a purpose that honors those values. And yeah, I've seen the power of that exercise in my own life. I've seen it in the life of other leaders that I've worked with. And um, yeah, if I didn't have that clarity on my own values, it would be very easy to get blown off course um, from uh, this this purpose-driven approach. So yeah, that's one thing I would really recommend leaders who are uh, working in this field is, have you got that clarity on the five to seven personal values that really light up your life? Yeah. And I think there's a difference. I think for a lot of us listening, they're probably like, well, I kind of, I mean, I kind of know, I have an idea, I have a sense. And what you're saying is like, yes, but that's not enough. You actually need to go through the exercise and you need to have them named. You need to be able to like bounce them off and be like, this is it. And there's a difference between a wishy-washy, I sense, you know, uh, sense of an idea, right? Um, versus this is it. Yeah, because once you've got clarity, you can use those values as as very specific tools. So one of the exercises I talked about in the book is a weekly exercise that I carried out for over 10 years and many of my clients use it, is that on a Sunday evening, I will sit down and I'll ask myself the question, I'll write it down, how am I going to honor my values this week? And then I have the list of values. You know, I see courage, I see sharing, I see flair, um, I see challenge. And I look at my diary and I map my values to the activities in my diary. And then I can get very intentional over time about filling my diary with value-driven activities that that are honoring these five to seven values. I can't do that exercise if I don't know what the five to seven values are. So if you don't have that input, you can't use those values to then work these exercises, particularly in that area of the, the op of the model. Yeah. Makes sense. And then I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how we need to take care of ourselves as leaders. I feel like this is something so many of us are struggling with right now, as you said, like the busyness of life and business and all the things and all the people are trying to do all the things for all the people. And um, I think a lot of people are still really struggling. Yeah, that's my experience. Uh, I think there's a a big, yeah, it's not just the uh, the pandemic, is it? We've had lots of shocks in our in our own w- ways, both globally and, and I'm sure personally as well. So uh, now in the in that in of the model, I learned a great deal on this aspect from the work I've done with elite sports coaches and athletes. I find that in the world of sport, the emphasis on motivation and resilience is so much more important than than in the world of organizational life. So a lot of my uh, work, as I say, I credit to what I've seen uh, put into action in in that world. And um, one of the um, exercises that I talk about in the book, which I've seen used by Olympic athletes, a very simple exercise, but um, I work with an Olympic team who every quarter, as they went through this four-year cycle to build up to the Olympics, used to conduct a radiators and drains exercise, as they called it, for themselves individually, but also for the team. Uh, quite simply, they would they would put up two columns, um, title one radiators and one drains, and they would list on the radiators all the people, events, activities, places, roles that lifted up their energy and motivation. And on the drains column, they would put all the people, places, activities, roles that drain their energy. And then once they got those lists very clear, they would make decisions about how to maximize the radiators and minimize the drains. Now, again, it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it's, it takes you like 10, 15 minutes to do this. But it's amazing how bringing that to the front of your mind, making conscious choices about these things, and then committing and holding accountability around that can be that difference between the 10% extra motivation that keeps you above water versus the 10% a drain that pulls you under. And, and these are the differences in leadership life. You know, it's, uh, the differences are, are very fine between thriving and surviving. 
And so any exercise like that, you know, as a coach, I, I just gather all of that up. I put it in a little kit bag. And in this book, I'm trying to share this. And not every exercise works for everyone. But I'm hoping that of the 19 exercises I've got in the book, if you if people pull out three or four, then that can be the difference, as I say, between thriving and, and surviving. Yeah, no, there. I, I loved that. I love that you you gave us in the book so many tangible exercises that we could do of like, these aren't just concepts, but here's how you apply them. And like you said, maybe you don't do because you even break it down. You can do this daily, weekly, monthly, you know, quarterly. And that's super helpful because sometimes, honestly, that it's it's nice to hear you say like, you don't have to do all of them because I think sometimes we overwhelm ourselves. Um, I got asked the other day, you know, what's your morning routine? And I was like, honestly, it's not great. <laughs> like I get up and I get dressed and I eat coffee. I know there's these entrepreneurs out there like exercising, meditating, journaling, wow. doing their affirmations, right? They have this whole, there's all these books yeah. now on your morning routine. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing good to just get up. And sometimes <laughs> I have to give myself grace to be like, it's okay if I don't do all these things. I can do these things and not these other things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And concentrate on your own you know, running your own race. And uh, yeah, there's all this out there. You, you're listening to things, you're reading things, but it's pulling out the things. Again, your values can help with that. You know, you, you know if, you, if you're clear about that op, it, it gives you that discernment that says, this isn't for me, it's for somebody else, but this one is for me. And that's, that's something I could work with and use and apply. So we've all, I think, um, learning how to be much more... Um, yeah, maybe discerning is the word because we're bombarded with so much good stuff and a lot of bad stuff as well. But even the good stuff can be overwhelming. <laughs> so how do we exercise discernment and use the limited energy that we've got in the best possible way? Yeah. When people make a shift and say, okay, I'm going to be this purpose-driven leader. I want my company to be to drive towards a purpose – and pro like you said, profit may be the vehicle, like it's still a piece of it, but it might be our profit that allows us to live out this purpose. And, you know, for a lot of the list, our listeners, they're lawyers. And I always say the lawyers are the helpers, like they're out there changing the laws, helping people make sense of things, solve problems. It feels very, to me, like it feels like it would be an easy shift for them, I think, to, to to grasp onto this idea, but I just wonder if you have any thoughts or advice for people who are still trying to kind of get a sense of, of where they would take this. Well, I've worked with a number of, of lawyers and, and CEOs of legal firms, and I find it interesting in the legal sector because on the one hand, you've got a lot of values-driven people. I mean, justice is a value that drives a lot of the purpose of lawyers, at least on day one. You know, that's why they that's why they study so hard. That's why they choose to go in this direction. So at heart, there is a very strong set of values, I think, driving a lot of people who are attracted to that profession. But on the other hand, I think it is a profession that has become incredibly institutionalized um, and professional. And, and I mean, I, I use that word uh, guardedly in a way that professional is is, is a good thing. But if you're not careful and you over-professionalize, over-institutionalize, you squeeze the spirit and the joy out of the original purpose. And there's always good reasons for, you know, the, um, the processes, the procedures. You know, we, we, we have to sort of recognize the value of these things. But I think it's keeping them as the, uh, the servants of the, of the firm rather than the masters of, of the firm. And that's hard, you know. I think it's such a mature, well-drilled, professional industry. And a lot of those things are great, but maybe some of that joy and that, that creativity and that values-driven flair, that maybe there's a bit more room for that to, to, to flourish such that, again, talent is attracted, talent is motivated, and, uh, and gives that extra 10 20% to the cause. Yeah. One of our values here is stay curious, and we're always trying to learn new things and stay curious about the world. And I'm just, I'm curious, you know, what are you working on next? What are you learning or improving right now that we might glean from? Yeah, well, I've, uh, I've got force for good out, you know, 
two months ago now, three months. So I'm on the road at the moment. You know, I'm doing, I'm doing this. I'm about to get on a train because tomorrow I'm doing a leadership workshop. You know, on this work um, with a um, a charity uh, group of leaders. So at the moment, I'm in the execute, execute, execute phase. Um, I'm 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 trying to avoid being too curious about too many new things. <laughs> <laughs> that's good too. <laughs> uh, because I wasn't very curious, and that's why I wrote this book, because I got curious. I got curious about what was going on in the world, after, particularly after the pandemic. So I've had that sort of phase. I've, I've given birth to something now called Force for Good. I want to give it its best chance in the world. Um, so I'm getting behind it, um, and, I, and I'm, and I'm going to be very focused on getting behind it for a period of time. And the way it works with me is I will, I will give this everything and there will be a day when i wake up and i go oh uh maybe it's time for something new and then i will and then i'll get curious um but but typically if you look i've i've published um three books and they've all been um there was a second edition of the uh second book and and they've all been four years apart i didn't Ah. plan it that way but it seems like there's a bit of a cycle that goes on for me which is Four years, you know, um, you go around a bit of a, a loop of uh, be curious, c- be creative, generate something, and then make sure it's it's going to have a, an impact as much as you can. You know, get behind it and, and focus on it. Don't don't sort of get distracted too quick onto the next shiny new thing. Um, so that's that's a little bit where I'm in yeah. the cycle, definitely. I think that's amazing advice because I I think sometimes, especially my small firm owners, we we talk about chasing the shiny things or the squirrels and, you know, we get excited and it's good to remember sometimes you're just in execution mode. You don't need a new big idea. You know, maybe the takeaway is you're staying curious about how this book now sits with people in the world and how they're going to use it and implement it. So, um, thank you. Like, thank you for writing it for, for, centering for for maybe giving us a different perspective of how we can use our businesses and our leadership and and the work we're doing in a different way to have a life of significance not just success to have both um we'll make sure to put the the notes uh the blah that was not the right way to say that we'll make sure to put the the book and a link to the book in the show notes any place else you'd like for people to go to learn more about your work and what you're doing Sure. Yeah. Um, the website is www.johnblakey.co.uk. Um, so yeah, lots of resources that I'm gathering together there. Um, so I think that's the best place to go. Um, keep it, keep it simple. And yeah, the, the book, um, is out there and, um, really grateful for this opportunity to, to, to reach the people for whom it was written. And, um, you know, it's, it's part of the joy of my purpose is to think, you know, that, out in the US, you know, we can get this message out there. I might not ever meet a lot of the people, but if somebody one day sends me an email and says, hey, I was listening to this podcast and you mentioned that exercise about radiators and drains and you know what, I've been doing it for five years and it's changed my life. You know, that's why you write books. That's purpose-driven leadership because that's what you've, you know, the, the fulfillment you feel when you get a little email like that every I don't know, three years <laughs> yes. is, 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 is makes it all worth it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's living it out. And uh, I want to make sure that I try and do that as best I can. Awesome. Well, thank you for being with me today. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. 